preface to the tower of london this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the tower of london by arthur poyser preface followed by verses by sir william gilbert from the yeoman of the guard full in the midst a mighty pile arose where iron grated gates their strength oppose to each invading step and strong and steep the battled walls arose the fosse sunk deep slow round the fortress rolled the sluggish stream and high in middle air the warder's turrets gleam anonymous the history of the tower of london is so closely bound up with the history of england from the norman conquest onwards that it is very difficult to write a record of the one without appearing to have attempted to write a record of the other a full history of the tower may read like an attenuated history of england when the problem has to be solved within the compass of a single chapter the difficulties are very considerably increased then again if a detailed account of tower annals has been given in a preliminary chapter there is nothing of any interest left to say when describing a visit to the several buildings within the tower walls if the dramatic scene in the council chamber of the white tower which ended in lord hastings being sent with scant ceremony to the block on the green below by richard the third be described in its proper place in the historical sketch chapter two it cannot again be spoken of in detail when the visit is paid chapter three to the room in which the event took place yet it is beyond doubt that a visitor to the tower would rather be reminded of that tragic council meeting when in the council chamber itself than come upon it in the course of the sketch of tower history which he would probably have read at home beforehand and forgotten in detail still those who read this book and have no opportunity of visiting the tower expect that the characters in the moving drama of its history shall have some semblance of life as they walk across the stage such a reader demands more than mere names and dates or he will skip an historical chapter as being intolerably dull it is no consolation to him to be told that if he will take patience and walk through and round the tower in imagination by keeping his temper and kindly reading chapters three and four he will discover that much of the human interest omitted in the history will be found by the wayside in the walks in former and larger books on the tower it will be seen that either the purely historical record under the headings of successive kings and queens dwarfs to insignificance the account of the buildings themselves or the description of the several towers and buildings which constitute the fortress prison occupies the bulk of the volume to the exclusion of any adequate historical record giving names and dates in chronological order but like most difficulties i think this one can be solved by a judicious compromise the chapters must be tuned to equal temperament i have endeavoured to keep the balance of the several sections as even as possible and an historic candidate for the honour of the headsman's axe who has been given immortality in the pages of english history by reason of the manner in which he was put to death passed over in one chapter will have some justice done to his memory in another i have attempted no pictorial description of the tower as a whole or in its several parts i dared not carry the theory i have just propounded into the realms of word-painting mr fullylove has relieved me of that duty he has brought the tower buildings as they stand to-day before the eyes of all who turn these pages this he has done with the brush infinitely better than i could do it with the pen though the pages at my disposal are so few in number i have had the temerity to attempt a description of much that is of interest outside tower walls i trust that this boldness may not prove after all to be a misplaced virtue my wish has been to persuade those who come to visit the tower that there is a great deal to be seen in its immediate vicinity that the majority of visitors have hitherto neglected either for want of time or want of guidance a noble and historic building like the tower resembles a venerable tree whose roots have spread into the soil in all directions during the uncounted years of its existence far beyond the position of its stem 
i tender grateful thanks to lieutenant-general sir george bryan millman k c b major of the tower for much kindness both to mr fullylove and myself and i can hardly express my indebtedness to the rev w k fleming who has so ungrudgingly given of his time to the task of correcting the proof-sheets arthur poyser trinity square tower hill e c verses by sir william gilbert when our gallant norman foes made our merry land their own and the saxons from the conqueror were flying at his bidding it arose in its panoply of stone a sentinel unliving and undying insensible i trow as a sentinel should be though a queen to save her head should come a-suing there's a legend on its brow that is eloquent to me and tells of duty done and duty doing the screw may twist and the rack may turn and men may bleed and men may burn on london town and all its hoard it keeps its solemn watch and ward within its wall of rock the flower of the brave have perished with a constancy unshaken from the dungeon to the block from the scaffold to the grave is a journey many gallant hearts have taken and the wicked flames may hiss round the heroes who have fought for conscience and for home in all its beauty but the grim old fortalice takes little heed of aught that comes not in the measure of its duty the screw may twist and the rack may turn and men may bleed and men may burn on london town and all its hoard it keeps its solemn watch and ward sir william gilbert end of preface with verses chapter one of the tower of london by arthur poyser this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter one introduction if our aunt's at london tower where i will want to be i never mare so does gang frae home till barn on a beer tree old scots ballad the tower as palace and prison has been singularly neglected in literature when we consider the part it has played in our history how closely it is knit up in the woof and web of our national life how far off days when england had not risen to the measure of her greatness down to the last hanoverian this fact surprises us shakespeare might well have laid all the scenes of another hamlet within its walls scott might have given its name to another waverly novel the possibilities are endless if scott had touched it we should have been spared the gloomy sentimentalities of ainsworth shakespeare in five acts could have given us a truer picture of tower comedy and tragedy than the tomes of bailey and de ross scott would have cast the same romance over the tower as he did over the rugged strip of land that lies between colander and inversnade we do not go to the trosachs because we have read of it in a gazetteer nor would we seek the forest of arden because we desired to walk in a wood burnham beeches would serve the purpose equally as well but we go to the tower because we have some vague idea that in our school days we remember it having been mentioned during the history lesson as a place where men were put into dungeons sometimes tortured frequently beheaded we have some indistinct notion too that our earlier kings lived there but whether they lived there at the same time as the men of state they had imprisoned executed or burnt we should not like to say off-hand and if the court was held here in the tower we have never tried to imagine in what part of the building it could have been properly accommodated we can accept whitehall and windsor without a murmur for the very names suggest kingliness and ample space but the tower it seems too grim and grimy too insignificant in position too circumscribed to conjure up visions of olden pageantries of state it is just here that the master hand would have changed our view a tragedy for the stage of the blackfriars theatre or the globe in southwark the work of a month of summer mornings at abbotsford or of winter afternoons in castle street would have fixed for all time the essentials in the picture and we should have gone to the tower with the definite aim of seeing the walls wherein a malvolio strutted where a macbeth made murder or where a romeo pined 
as we walked over tower green we might have expected to meet a dandy denmont with the peppers and mustards at his heels a rashly lurking by a dougald dalgety of drum wacket discussing the merits of rhenish wine and a kirschenwasser with the yeoman warders had we lived in the tower through the greater part of a book as we are shut up in lochleven castle with queen mary in the abbot we should have visited again and again the rooms and cells in which with roland graham and the douglases we had spent so unforgettable a time in our lives it is true that shakespeare lays scenes of his historical plays in the tower and that scott brings julian peveril and nigel within its traitor's gate for a space but the dramatist is merely copying locality from the history books and the novelist is so impatient with the fate that has carried two of his young men under the archway of the bloody tower that he cuts off his chapter with the words but the thoughts and occurrences of a prison are too uniform for a narrative and we must now convey our readers into a more bustling scene surely sir walter this is too scant an excuse to drive us out of one of the most wonderful buildings in the world to the spacious mansion of the duke of buckingham with the domain belonging to it the foundations of which are now covered by the hotel cecil and the domain blotted out by the buildings of the strand and the adelphi the tide carried them up under a dark and lowering arch closed at the upper end by the well-known traitor's gate formed like a wicket of huge intersecting bars of wood through which might be seen a dim and imperfect view of soldiers and warders upon duty and of the steep ascending causeway which leads up from the river into the interior of the fortress by this gate and it is the well-known circumstance which assigned its name those accused of state crimes were usually committed to the tower the thames afforded a secret and silent mode of conveyance for transporting thither such whose fallen fortunes might move the commiseration or whose popular qualities might excite the sympathy of the public and even where no cause for especial secrecy existed the peace of the city was undisturbed by the tumult attending the passage of the prisoner and his guards through the most frequented streets here we have the beginning of quite an admirable tower romance our hero lands at the fatal steps and as he walks up under the bloody tower a handkerchief is dropped down from the window of the cell in which archbishop laud was imprisoned from within that darkened room a female voice in a tone wherein grief and joy were indescribably mixed exclaimed my son my dear son we feel our plot moves quickly when the warder picks up the mysterious bit of cambric and looks at it with the jealous minuteness of one who is accustomed to detect secret correspondence in the most trifling acts of intercourse there may be writing on it with invisible ink said one of his comrades it is wetted but i think it is only with tears answered the senior i cannot keep it from the poor gentleman ah master colby said his comrade in a gentle tone of reproach you would have been wearing a better coat than a yeoman to-day had it not been for a tender heart it signifies little said old colby while my heart is true to my king what i feel in discharging my duty or what coat keeps my old bosom from the cold weather spoken like a true son of the old tower we say and feel ourselves already with peveril listening to the warders talk as they take him to his cell we begin to breathe the tower atmosphere we hear a groan from one cell the clank of chains from another we see a young yeoman whispering words of love into the ear of a maid who was born and has grown up within the battlements that bound us on all sides and we see some boys at play round the spot where to-morrow a human being may suffer death and over all this little world within the walls where comedy and tragedy shake hands each day rises the conqueror's norman keep unchanged and unchangeable here is a quarry indeed in which to dig for material for a whole series of novels and plays and yet sir walter beheads our little romance on tower green and spirits us away into a more bustling scene shakespeare brings us to the tower four times in the course of the three parts of king henry the sixth and four times during king richard the third 
in the former play we witness the death of the imprisoned edmund mortimer in the fourth act of part two there is a short tower scene of a dozen lines the sixth scene of part three act four headed a room in the tower brings us to king henry asking the lieutenant of the tower what fees incurred during his the king's captivity are due to him and in the sixth scene of the last act of the same part we are again in a room in the tower where king henry is discovered sitting with a book in his hand the lieutenant attending here in the course of the scene henry is stabbed by gloucester and with the words o god forgive my sins and pardon thee dies in richard the third when in the first act we are taken into the room in the tower in which clarence is murdered and see the evil deed performed as later in the play we are again in the tower at the smothering of the sleeping princes we feel that shakespeare has in these moving scenes brought before our eyes the grim reality of two evil deeds done in secret within the prison-house set up by william the norman and henry the third but here again our dramatist is only telling over again the story told in england's records and it is all a tale of unrelieved gloom that is why we have come to associate the tower with murder torture and evil passions we forget that the sun shone on the royal palace on the green and even sent a beam of its rays into many a dreary cell that flowers grew in the constable's garden and made fragrance there as sweetly as in the cottage gardens deep down in the quietude of the shires that jailers and warders had not invariably hearts of stone that prisoners by taking thought and snatching an instant opportunity had found a way through the walls then to a boat on the river and so to liberty in describing the shifts and hopes and disappointments that at last reached their close in so happy a curtain we would wish our dramatist had been moved to write another all's well that ends well with a tower background when we discover prince henry poins and old sir john at their deep drinking at the boar's head tavern we feel we have the east cheap of the early fifteenth century recreated for us and that is because shakespeare is allowing his fancy free play and is not bound down to the repetition of mere historical facts so would we have gained had he dealt thus with the tower and laid a stage romance there as well as the portions of the strictly historical plays we have already referred to the history of the tower as the history of other places will give us names of famous men and the numbering of years in plenty but of the inner everyday life of some early century there nothing it is only the skilful in stagecraft and romance that dare touch the tower to turn its records to such uses men of less skill fail and give us novels and plays that make weary reading and weary sitting out many a tale has been penned of the times of the papist prosecution for instance into which the people of the tower have been brought but so feeble has the grasp of the subject been that we turn to actual history for the real romance and exclaim with greater conviction than ever that fact is more wonderful than fiction it has been said that the distinctive charm of the historical novel is that it seems to combine fact and fiction in a way that tickles the intellectual palate in conversation we are interested in a story if some one we know is an actor in it historical fiction has a like piquancy because it mingles men and women known to tradition and history with fictitious heroes and heroines and minor characters there life is large and important we learn what it is to be of some service to the state we feel the fascination of great causes and great leaders the reviving influence of the liberty of wide spaces in time and distance there we breathe an ampler ether a diviner air and in spite of sir leslie stephen who characterizes the historical romance as pure cram or else pure fiction we prefer to have our history made living for us by the touch of a shakespeare or a scott to come to our own day i can imagine no more delightful excursion into the brighter side of tower romance than the wholly fictitious but happily conceived savoy opera the yeoman of the guard 
who can look upon the white tower here after seeing its model on the savoy stage and yet not remember the delicious melodies of the opera the very spirit of tower times of long ago of tower griefs and joys of tower quips and cranks and lilting songs seems brought before us in the theatre when on the rising of the curtain we look across tower green see the gable end of st peter's church and have the huge bulk of the central keep reaching up toward the blue heaven and the little comedy brings the old tower nearer to our hearts and perhaps to our understanding we see it is quite possible for men to love and laugh and dance even if to-morrow they see a comrade meet death on the very spot where they had held merriment with the strolling players it is all very human very full of life's sunshine though it is felt and known that behind it all there is suffering bravely borne and deeper sorrow yet to come but we applaud the daring of librettist and musician complete success has justified all here again we are safe in master hands we have been led down a byway in tower history by plot and counterplot with fragrant music for our cheer when we come again to the actual tower of to-day lying it may be under a summer sky we should like to find phoebe sitting on the green at her spinning wheel singing when maiden loves or see jack point teaching the surly jailer and assistant tormentor wilfred chadbolt to be a jester it is by such paths that boys and maidens should be led to the right understanding of tower history appeal to their imagination first give them a typical day in the old life of the place and so clothe the mere skeleton of dates and isolated facts i often wonder what impression of the tower a child brings away after a hurried christmas holiday visit on a free day when the place is little more than a glorified show to the child the jewel room can only appeal as something very like the shop window of a bond street jeweller and much less easy in the jostling crowd to get a glimpse of a benevolent warder will hurry the family party through the dungeons and keep up a running commentary of dates and names of statesmen traitors and kings covering vast spaces of english history in a single breath the white tower will that night reappear in the child's dreams as a branch of the army and navy stores where they have nicely polished armour on view where there is a wonderful collection of swords and bayonets displayed on the walls in imitation of sunflowers where policemen will allow you to move in one direction only and forbid you to turn back to see anything you may have omitted or passed too hurriedly where queen elizabeth appears to be preserved in a glass case and wears remarkably well and where large whitewashed vaults in which are kept cannons sent by the king suggests the lower regions of south kensington museum and not the torture chamber of guy fox if that child in the air and sunshine of the following morning does not take a dislike to the tower as a rather gloomy madame tussauds and too festive a prison it will be surprising indeed the tower buildings at the present day have been treated in a manner that destroys an illusion it is the fault of economy and compromise the attempt has been made to convert the old buildings into dwelling-places with modern comforts and to accommodate there not only the families of the warders but also a military garrison the warders live in the smaller towers and these though full of historic interest are closed to the public for the convenience of the garrison a paternal war office has caused to be erected on the ground where the old cold harbour tower stood the most unsightly building it is possible to conceive within tower walls but the putting up of such a monstrosity convinces one that the greatest want of the present age is imagination the men who could plan and then construct in brick and sandstone these quarters must have been those who were hurried through the old fortress in their youth and who like the child we have mentioned took a not unnatural dislike to his majesty's tower in no other way can the blunder be accounted for in spite of the cheapening and vulgarizing of the tower by governments and state officials it retains a surprising hold on the people even the mill-hands of lancashire surging up to london to witness a football cup tie think their visit to london incomplete until they have walked through the tower 
but whatever impression may be on their minds when they have done the building these impressions are rudely brushed away in the subsequent excitement at sydenham it would be interesting to hear their reply to the question and what did you think of the tower of london when they return to their friends and relations in the north country it would certainly give an excellent idea of the result of years of school board education of free library reading and a visit to the actual scene of historical events the cell where raleigh wrote is looked upon with lacklustre eye by the youth whose one idea of literature is the football edition of the evening papers the tower itself is the most precious jewel in the nation's crown it is the epitome of english history from the norman conquest to the day that has just dawned we have something here to remind us of our storied past it might be the most interesting spot in england to young and to old alike in these days of rush and turmoil and ceaseless activities it might be the one corner of modern london where the present is quelled in its noise and stayed in its hurry to contemplate the past these buildings might well be revered by those who are hardly yet conscious of their value they at least might be spared the impertinent aggression of to-day a commercial age has committed one unforgivable crime in pulling down crosby hall to erect a bank and we may well ask ourselves if the tower itself is safe from such vandalism again it is want of imagination our city magnates can appreciate a bank with its hideous granite pillars and its vapid ornamentations but an ancient hall which shakespeare has touched with his magic pen is of no practical use mark you it is a result of the detestable gospel of get on or get out and as our old buildings are incapable of going on they must go out our fear may well be lest the modernizing of the tower and the erection within the walls of holy caricature less piles that would be considered unworthy of place even in a rising suburb will in time destroy our sense of the value of any of the buildings bequeathed to us from earliest times little by little the boys of to-day who will be the citizens of the day after to-morrow will come to look at the tower as a very ill-painted showroom or as none too spacious a place to accommodate a garrison it must we may hear them say when they become men of importance either be brought up to date as an exhibition of antiquities or be rebuilt to meet increasing military requirements all this is conceivable few things are held sacred nowadays as we know to our sorrow the spirit of the twentieth century is alien from the spirit still brooding over the tower and which has not been quite dispelled by latter-day encroachments yet when we find the great dungeon under the white tower wired for electric light we begin to wonder what the end will be may we not hope that wiser counsels will prevail and that we shall have the tower restored in the better sense of the term to something of its appearance in elizabethan and jacobean times how refreshing it would be to leave the traffic of great tower street behind and pass into the tranquillity of shakespeare's day as we entered the tower gateway the modern policeman should no longer repeat the irritating cry get your tickets get your tickets at the foot of tower hill the wretched refreshment shed which all visitors are compelled to pass through should no longer assail us on our entry with its close atmosphere savouring of stale buns even on free days this ticket procedure has to be gone through solemnly and the turnstiles to be pushed round to satisfy some mystic regulation it is all very suggestive of a circus and reminds us that as a nation we are singularly lacking in the sense of humour the stage lighting effects in connection with the crown jewels in the wakefield tower certainly charmed the glitter-loving multitude but this dazzling cageful of royal gold plate stands we are apt to forget in a room where henry the sixth had an oratory and where tradition tells he was murdered in cold blood as he knelt before the altar that stood in the recess of the southeast corner of the chamber here was committed one of the most barbarous murders that even the tower has recorded in its blood-stained annals as one authority has it 
but who to-day has leisure to think of this when told to move on as one of the crowd surging round the regalia cage by yet another policeman who might have just come in from the duties of regulating motor omnibuses in the strand i dwell on these points in order to show how hopeless it is to catch any of the real spirit and message of the tower when to-day 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 is ever intruding itself we ask for leisure to contemplate a far-off yesterday and to teach the boys and girls we take to the tower something of the value of the tower buildings as concrete embodiments of england's noble history but we are only permitted to walk hurriedly in one specified direction and illusion is destroyed at every point i should like however to say lest i may be misunderstood that from the tower officials one receives nothing but courtesy they are not to blame they are performing the duties imposed on them from without the pity is that the restless spirit of the age should have found its way within walls hallowed to the memories of england's kings and the sufferings of her greatest and worthiest men were that spirit denied all access to this one spot lying in the heart of modern london a visit to the tower would mean to young and old alike very much more than it means to-day the feeling of reverence which is so sadly lacking in people of all ranks of life might once again be shown by all who entered these solemn portals it is in the hope that a record of tower history and romance presented anew in the form which this volume takes may deepen the interest in and the love for the tower of london that this book was written it does not attempt within its narrow limits to give a detailed and exhaustive account of occurrences that has been admirably done by others before now but it does attempt by the aid of carefully prepared pictures to recreate not only what has been bequeathed to us from a fascinating past but also the life and colour of the tower as it stands to-day in less spoiled aspects a dry repetition of facts and dates may make an accurate history for the scholar's shelves but it would remain unread by all else such books have their place and a worthy place but they would not convey to the mind of one who has never seen the tower a really adequate conception of its past and present this book may fail to bring the tower in all its strange charm to the heart and mind of a lonely reader on the prairies of manitoba or in the australian bush but the attempt has been made and it is not for writer or artist to say whether it has been achieved or not as i look from my window day by day across tower hill at the noble old buildings lying beyond and watch them when silhouetted against a morning sky or lit up by the glow of evening sunshine i often wonder if justice can ever be done to them now that we have no shakespeare and no walter scott while walking in the garden wherein is set the stone that records the last execution in seventeen forty seven on that blood-stained spot one cannot but contemplate the possibility of even this solemn place being some day violated by the hands of those who scheme our city improvements still one may hope that england in her heart will ponder these things and will save the tower and tower hill from vandalism that she will realize more and more as years roll on what a precious heritage she has here a heritage that was born at her birth has grown with her growth and may not be destroyed while she breeds strong sons to guard her treasures end of chapter one chapter two of the tower of london by arthur poyser this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two historical sketch part one tis all a checkerboard of nights and days where destiny with men for pieces plays hither and thither moves and mates and slays and one by one back in the closet lays omar khayyam the protoplasm from which the present tower grew was a rude celtic fort on the river slope of tower hill then came the romans and built their london wall at the angle of which commanding the thames seaward they also constructed a fortress a portion of this arx palatina can still be seen to the east of the white tower 
but no part of this roman work remains in the present tower though shakespeare speaks of julius caesar's tower in richard the second tower history as we know it in any detail begins with the conquest the conqueror set gundulf a well-travelled monk of the monastery of beck who had seen many beautiful buildings in the course of his wanderings to work on the low ground between the hill and the river and there on the camping-ground of the britons and romans arose the white tower completed about ten seventy eight gundulf was not only a builder but an administrator and the chronicles tell us that as bishop of rochester where he rebuilt the cathedral he was most earnest in the discharge of his episcopal duties when we reach the reign of henry i we have tidings of our first prisoner ralph flambard bishop of durham he was immured for illegally raising funds for the upkeep of this very fortress but had no desire to remain long an inmate within the walls he had been so anxious aforetime to preserve a rope was conveyed to him in a wine cask with the wine he fuddled his keepers with the rope he proceeded to lower himself down the outer wall of the white tower and not at all alarmed at finding the rope too short and his arrival on the ground somewhat sudden he was able to mount on horseback ride to a seaport and embark for normandy subsequently he returned to durham where he completed the cathedral and built norham castle in which scott lays the opening scene of marmion the tower now became a royal palace and remained the dwelling-place of the kings of england or at times the stronghold to which they would retire when danger threatened until the days of charles the second at this early period of its history too it was found that a collection of wild beasts would lend some zest to life within its walls this royal menagerie was located on the ground where the ticket office and the refreshment rooms now stand and was removed in eighteen thirty four it is said that the term going to see the lions of a place arose from the fashionable habit of visiting the tower lions and the lane off great tower street just beyond all hallows barking was at one time not beer but bear lane and evidently led down to the pits in which the bears were expected to provide amusement for court circles stephen kept whitsuntide in the tower in eleven forty and in that year the tower was in the charge of geoffrey de mandeville who had accompanied the conqueror to england but in eleven fifty three it was held for the crown by richard de lucy chief justiciary of england in trust for henry of anjou and to him it reverted on stephen's death it was a popular superstition at this time that the red appearance of the mortar used in binding the tower walls was caused by the blood of beasts having been mixed with it in the making but the ruddy tent was really the result of an admixture of pulverized roman bricks with the lime when richard i went off to the crusades the tower was left in the keeping of his chancellor longchamp and king john on usurping the throne laid siege to the fortress which longchamp surrendered to him in twelve fifteen the tower was again besieged this time by the barons and the citizens of london but though the stronghold had but a poor garrison it held out successfully in twelve sixteen the rebellious nobles handed over the custody of the tower to the dauphin louis but he appears to have considered the task too irksome and speedily returned to his own land one of the greatest names in tower history was that of henry the third who appointed adam of lamborn master mason of the buildings and began to build and rebuild to adorn and to beautify never satisfied until he had made the tower of london a royal dwelling-place indeed to the norman chapel in the white tower he gave stained glass and decorated the walls with frescoes to st peter's on tower green he gave a set of bells he constructed the wharf and the massive st thomas's tower and traitor's gate were set up by him but he had his difficulties to contend with these additions to the fortification were unpopular with the citizens without the walls and when a high tide washed away the wharf and undermining the foundations of the new tower over traitor's gate brought it twice to the ground the people rejoiced hoping the king would own that fate was against him 
but after each disaster his only comment seems to have been build it stronger and there is henry's wharf and st thomas's tower recently restored to this day henry also built the outer wall of the tower facing the moat and in many other ways made the place a stronghold sure the wisdom of what had been done was soon made manifest for henry had many a time to take refuge within the tower walls while rebellious subjects howled on the slopes of tower hill for their unkind treatment of his wife queen eleanor henry never forgave the people of london and so defied them from within what had really become his castle walls eleanor was avaricious proud arrogant and became so unpopular that when on one occasion she had left the wharf by water for westminster she was received as her barge came into view of london bridge with such execrations and shouts of drown the witch or sounds to that effect that she returned in terror to the tower in twelve forty four griffin son of llewellyn was brought as prisoner to the white tower and detained as a hostage he attempted to emulate the redoubtable flambard by making a rope of his bedclothes and dropping from his window by such means to the ground but he had forgotten to take the weight of his body into his calculations he was a stout man his hastily constructed rope was insecure it broke as he hung upon the wall of the tower and he was killed by the fall edward i when he returned from the holy land made the last additions of any consequence that were ever made to the tower buildings the moat was formed in his day and put then into much of its present shape it has of course been cleaned out and deepened from time to time though there was always more mud than water in its basin and at one period it was considered an offence that led to instant death for any man to be discovered bathing therein probably because he was almost certain to die from the effects of a dip in such fluid as was to be found there multitudes of jews were imprisoned in the dungeons under the white tower in this reign on the charge of clipping the coin of the realm and the welsh and scottish wars were the cause of many notable warriors such as the earls of athol menteith and ross king balliol and his son edward and in thirteen o five the patriot william wallace being given habitation in tower dungeons the noble wallace bravest of scots was put to death at smithfield after some semblance of trial in westminster hall but his name will never be forgotten for it is enshrined by burns in one of the noblest of scottish songs edward the second had no great partiality towards the tower as a palace but often retired there when in danger in thirteen twenty two his eldest daughter was born there and from the place of her birth was called joan of the tower she lived to become by marrying david bruce queen of scotland in thirteen twenty seven we hear of the first woman to be imprisoned in tower walls about this time lady battlesmere for refusing hospitality to queen isabella and giving orders that the royal party was to be attacked as it approached her castle of leeds in kent lord mortimer a welsh prisoner contrived to escape from his dungeon by the old expedient of making his jailers drunk he escaped to france but soon returned and with edward's queen isabella was party to edward's death at berkeley castle whither the king had fled from london the tower had been left in the care of stapleton bishop of exeter but the unfortunate man was seized by a mob of turbulent citizens dragged into cheapside and there put to death poor stapleton was a man of exemplary character and a generous patron of learning he founded exeter college oxford and beautified exeter cathedral the rebel mortimer and queen isabella thought it prudent to keep the young edward the third within tower walls in a state of semi-captivity but the lad's spirit was such that he soon succeeded in casting off the restraint and threw himself on the goodwill of his people mortimer was captured in nottingham brought to the tower then hanged drawn and quartered at tyburn elms where the marble arch now stands the young king's wars in france and scotland were begun and after the capture of caen over three hundred of its wealthiest men were brought to the tower together with the constable of france the count d'eu and the count of tankerville 
it was while making preparations for this french war that edward resided in the tower and came to know its weakness and its strength he placed a powerful garrison within its battlements when he set off for normandy but he was not satisfied in his heart with the state of his royal fortress returning secretly from france and landing one november night at the wharf he found as he had expected the place but ill guarded the governor the chancellor and several other officers were imprisoned for neglect of their duties and the king set his house in order the scottish king david bruce was captured at neville's cross in thirteen forty six and froissart describes how a huge escort of armed men guarded the captive king who was mounted on a black charger and brought him to the tower through narrow city streets crowded with sightseers past bodies of city companies drawn up and clad in richest robes in january thirteen forty seven at the tower gate bruce was given with much ceremony into the custody of sir john darcy then governor the imprisoned king remained in the tower eleven years king john of france and philip his son were brought captives here in thirteen forty eight after poitiers though the scots king had been liberated and they were so deprived of his society yet it appears they had no unpleasant time of it in their quarters there were many french nobles within the gates to make the semblance of a court both john and philip were set free in thirteen sixty by the treaty of bretigny richard the second began his reign amid great rejoicings and feastings and the tower rang with revelries on the day of his coronation the king left his palace fortress in great state clad in white robes and looking as one account has it as beautiful as an archangel london seemed to have lost its sense of humour if the sense had been at all developed at that time for in cheapside we are told a castle had been erected from two sides of which wine ran forth abundantly and at the top stood a golden angel holding a crown so contrived that when the king came near she bowed and presented it to him in each of the towers was a beautiful virgin and each blew in the king's face leaves of gold and flowers of gold counterfeit while the populace yelled blessing on their new monarch and the conduits ran wine but scarcely was the wine stain out of the streets when the wat tyler rebellion broke out and it seemed likely that the cobbles would be soon stained red again but not with wine richard and his mother sought refuge in the tower while the yells beyond the walls were no longer those of acclamation but of detestation froissart likens the mob's cries to the hooting of devils richard set out on the thames to a conference with the leaders of the insurgents at rotherite but taking alarm before he had gone far down the river returned hurriedly to the tower steps with him in his place of security were treasurer hales and archbishop simon of sudbury for whose heads the mob shouted mayor walworth suggested a sally upon the infuriated crowds but this remedy was considered too desperate and abandoned the mob on tower hill demanded sudbury sudbury was to be delivered to them give them sudbury the awful glare of fire shone into the tower casements and the king looked out and saw the houses of many of his nobles being burnt to the ground the savoy was on fire westminster added flames to colour the waters of the thames and fire was seen to rise from the northern heights richard was but a boy and so hard a trial found him almost unequal to the strain it imposed what was to be done the king being persuaded to meet his rebellious subjects at mile end conceded their demands and granted pardons there was a garrison of twelve hundred well-armed men in the tower but they were panic-stricken when on the departure of the king the rebel mob which had stood beyond the moat rushed over the drawbridges and into the very heart of the buildings archbishop sudbury was celebrating mass when the mob caught him dragged him forth from the altar and dispatched him on tower hill treasurer hales was also killed and both heads were exposed on the gateway of old london bridge yet two days later tyler's head was placed where sudbury's had been and the archbishop was buried with much pomp in canterbury cathedral 
in thirteen eighty seven richard again sought refuge in the tower the duke of gloucester and other nobles had become exasperated at the weak king's ways and a commission appointed by gloucester proceeded to govern the kingdom richard's army offering opposition was defeated subsequently a conference was held in the council chamber of the white tower and richard on some kind of agreement being reached left the tower for westminster the king's greatest friend sir simon burley was led to death on tower hill and his execution richard swore to avenge his opportunity came three years later another state procession left the tower with the king as before the chief personage in the midst of the brave show richard had married isabel daughter of charles the sixth of france she had been dwelling in the tower until the day of her coronation in the midst of the festivities that celebrated the joyous event gloucester was seized by the king's orders shipped off to calais and murdered the earl of arundel was beheaded on tower hill warwick the king dared not kill as he had done so much for his country in the wars with france but after confinement in the beecham tower he was sent to the isle of man and there kept in prison for life but richard in planning the fall of these men brought destruction upon himself he lost all self-control and mr gardiner believed that it was most probable without being actually insane his mind had to some extent given away parliament was dissolved the king would rule without one he would assume the powers of an autocrat events moved swiftly john of gaunt's son henry of lancaster landed in england in thirteen ninety nine richard was taken prisoner and on september second of that year was brought to the tower a prisoner in the white tower shakespeare however lays the scene in westminster hall he resigned his crown and shadowy king that he always was vanished into the dark shadow that shrouds his end henry the fourth began his reign with the revival of tower festivities on the eve of his coronation after much feasting and rejoicing a solemn ceremonial took place in the norman chapel of st john where forty-six new knights of the order of the bath watched their arms all night with henry's reign begins also the list of state prisoners in the tower which was becoming less of a palace and more of a prison the first captives were welshmen llewellyn a relation of owen glendower being brought here in fourteen o two in the following year the abbot of winchelsea and other ecclesiastics were committed for inciting to rebellion but henry's most notable prisoner was prince james of scotland this lad of eleven was heir of robert the third after the death of rosie whose sad end is described in the fair maid of perth king robert died it is said of a broken heart when he heard of his son's captivity and james became de facto king of scotland while unjustly immured in henry's prison-house he remained a prisoner for eighteen years two of which were spent in the tower from there he was removed to nottingham castle and his uncle the duke of albany acted as regent of the northern kingdom it is interesting to learn from some english and scottish records that his expenses in the tower were six shillings eight pence a day for himself and three shillings four pence for his attendants henry v on becoming king in fourteen thirteen was according to the chronicles of london brought to the tower upon the friday and on the morrow he rode through cheap with a great rout of lords and knights the which he had new made in the tower on the night before about this time the tower was full of persecuted followers of wycliffe the most famous being sir john oldcastle lord of gobham he had been a trusted servant of henry the fourth to him was allotted the task of quelling insurrection in wales at the time of the battle of shrewsbury and he then stood in high favour with the king and his son now henry v a severe law had been passed with regard to those who held the principles of wycliffe and at the time of henry v's accession oldcastle was found to favour the condemned lawler doctrines not long afterwards by virtue to quote j r green of the first legal enactment of religious bloodshed which defiled our statute book sir john was a captive in the tower and the king forgetting old friendship allowed matters to take their course 
but old castle who evidently had friends and unknown adherents within the tower walls mysteriously escaped and the lollards encouraged brought their rising to a head it was said that they had plotted to kill the king and make old castle regent of the kingdom but their insurrection was quelled the more prominent lollards were either burnt or hanged and sir john after wanderings in wales was caught brought back to the tower and in december fourteen seventy some say on christmas day was hung in chains and burnt over a slow fire in smithfield he is the original of shakespeare's falstaff but had very little in common with that creation of the dramatist's fancy shakespeare admits this in an epilogue where he says for old castle died a martyr and this is not the man in tennyson's poem sir john oldcastle this brave old man exclaims god willing i will burn for him and truly he suffered a terrible death for his convictions after agincourt we have another notable prisoner in the tower in the person of charles duke of orleans who was sent to the white tower with a ransom of three hundred thousand crowns on his head this captive as did james of scotland before him passed many of the weary hours of captivity writing poetry in the british museum there is preserved a manuscript volume of his poems which is invaluable as containing the oldest picture of the tower which is known to exist this picture beautifully coloured shows the great keep of william the conqueror whitewashed hence its present name and in the background the steep grassy slope of tower hill old london bridge and the spires and towers of ancient london it is a remarkable work of art and is accessible to all in its many reproductions charles was liberated in fourteen forty in the reign of henry the sixth the early days of the sixth henry were not marked in tower annals by events of great interest and during the later wars of the roses the number of captives sent here was small for most of them were murdered in cold blood on the battlefields little quarter was given after those fights to the death and during the weary years of warfare the peerage as one writer has it was almost annihilated the cade rebellion broke out in fourteen fifty in which year william de la pole duke of suffolk who had been charged with supporting it was murdered he was one of the most distinguished noblemen in england yet the tragedy that ended his life was a sordid one upon a wholly unsubstantiated charge of treason he was shut up in the tower as he could not be proven guilty he was released and banished the country he took ship at dover to cross to calais but was captured in the channel by the captain of a vessel named nicholas of the tower this was a name of ill omen to suffolk to whom it had been told in prophecy that could he avoid the danger of the tower he would be safe as captive he was brought back to dover and his last moments are described in king henry the sixth part two act four scene one with realism in the summer of fourteen fifty lord say was sent to the tower by the king to propitiate the rebels and they had him forth and beheaded him in cheapside cade and his followers were attacking the fortress from southwark but at nightfall a sortie was made from the tower london bridge was barricaded and a truce being called the rebellion gradually subsided cade's capture in a garden in kent is told by shakespeare in the tenth scene of the fourth act of the play just mentioned taunton heath was fought and lost by the lancastrians the battle of hexham crushed the remnant of the king's army the valiant queen margaret fled taking her young son with her and very soon afterwards poor henry himself was led captive and placed in the wakefield tower where in the room in which the regalia is shown at the present day he was murdered we are told by richard of gloucester or more probably by his orders on may the twenty first fourteen seventy one but before his death warwick that king-maker slain at barnet in 1471 had given orders for henry to be led on horseback through the city streets while a turncoat populace shouted god save king harry this was a poor and short-lived triumph the weary-hearted king clad in a blue gown soon returned to the walls he was fated never again to leave alive 
the city was flourishing under yorkist rule and was not minded to seek lancastrian restoration it was the pull of prosperity against sentiment the former won as it usually contrives to do and along with sentiment down went king henry queen margaret had meanwhile been brought to the tower though she and her husband were both within tower gates they did not meet again the queen was imprisoned for five years for part of that time at windsor and then was allowed to return to her own country we meet her once again in scots anne of geierstein cannon that had as has been said come into use for the first time at crecy were during henry's reign used by the yorkists to batter down the walls of the tower but unsuccessfully in eighteen forty three when the moat was dried and cleared out a large number of stone cannon-balls were recovered and in all probability were those used at this bombardment edward the fourth had given the customary feast at the tower on the coronation eve and made thirty-two knights within its walls these knights of the bath arrayed in blue gowns with hoods and tokens of white silk upon their shoulders rode before the new king on his progress from the tower to westminster abbey on his coronation day the king began his reign by sending lancastrians to the tower and beheading two sir thomas tuddenham and sir william tyrrell on tower hill the tower had come upon its darkest days though edward favoured the fortress a great deal as a place of residence rebuilt its fortifications and deepened its moat he also used it as a convenient place for ridding himself of all he wished to put out of his way victim after victim suffered cruel death within its walls his brother clarence mysteriously disappeared tradition has maintained he was drowned in a butt of malmsey wine but that has never been proved in any way however the secrecy as to the manner of his death makes it none the less tragic to the imagination how his last moments were passed the stones of the bower tower alone could tell us young edward v was brought to the tower by the duke of gloucester and buckingham professing great loyalty and arranging that his coronation should take place on the twenty second of june following but richard of gloucester was determined that if craft and strategy could accomplish his ends the next coronation would be his own lord hastings ever loyal to the boy king was brought to the axe on tower green and an attempt was made by the scheming richard who was now protector to prove that edward was no true heir to the crown it was with a fine show of unwillingness that he accepted the call to kingship but in july fourteen eighty three he was crowned at westminster edward and his ten-year-old brother richard disappeared we shall return to a consideration of their fate when examining the bloody tower richard the third following the custom gave sumptuous entertainments in the tower to celebrate his first days as king and the usual elaborate procession issued forth on the coronation day from the tower gate climbed the hill and wended its way through the tortuous london streets to the city of westminster beyond richard seems to have spent much of his time when in his capital within his fortress palace and to have taken interest in at least one building near by the church of all hallows barking on tower hill as we shall see in chapter six owes much to richard who appears to have considered tower walls thick enough to hide his evil deeds and keep out his good ones during this reign as we find in the wyatt papers a state prisoner sir henry wyatt was thrown into a tower dungeon for favouring tudor claims and supporting henry of richmond richard it is said had him tortured but the brave soldier refused to forsake his poor and unhappy master afterwards henry the seventh and so the king in a rage had him confined in a low and narrow cell where he had not clothes sufficient to warm him and was an hungered the legend proceeds he had starved then had not god who sent a crow to feed his prophet sent this and his country's martyr a cat both to feed and warm him it was his own relation from whom i had the story a cat came one day down into the dungeon and as it were offered herself unto him he was glad of her laid her on his bosom to warm him and by making much of her won her love 
after this she would come every day unto him divers times and when she could get one brought him a pigeon he complained to his keeper of his cold and short fare the answer was he durst not better it but said sir henry if i can provide any will you promise to dress it for me i may well enough said the keeper you are safe for that matter and being urged again promised him and kept his promise the prisoner dressed each time the pigeon the cat provided and the prisoner was no longer unhungered sir henry wyatt in his days of prosperity when henry the seventh had come to the throne and made his faithful follower a privy councillor did ever make much of cats and the old writer goes on perhaps you will not find his picture anywhere but with a cat beside him wyatt afterwards became rich enough under kingly favour to purchase allington castle one of the finest places of its kind in kent there are other tower stories of men saddened in their captivity being helped in various ways by dumb animals many of them we may hope are true our necessarily rapid journey through history has brought us to the illustrious tudor kings and queens the tower was never more prominent in england's records than during tudor reign from seventh henry to the last days of great elizabeth the early years of the new king were to be remembered by an imprisonment in tower walls that had little sense of justice as excuse when the duke of clarence was put to death in edward the fourth's reign he left behind him his eldest son then only three years old whom richard after his own son's death had a mind to nominate as his heir this was edward earl of warwick who came to be shut up simply because he was a representative of the fallen house of york and had a better right to claim the crown than henry tudor that was his only offence but it was sufficient he lingered in confinement while lambert simnel was impersonating him in ireland in fourteen eighty seven he was led forth from his cell to parade city streets for a day of what must have tasted almost like happy freedom in order that he might be seen of the people and once again was he brought back to his place of confinement henry's position was again in danger when in fourteen ninety two perkin warbeck a young fleming landed in ireland and proclaimed himself to be richard plantagenet duke of york son of edward the fourth his tale was that when his brother edward was murdered in the tower he had escaped he was even greeted some time afterwards by the duchess of burgundy edward the fourth's sister as her nephew and called the white rose of england with assistance from france and scotland warbeck landed in england and after many vicissitudes was captured and put in the tower from whence he planned to escape and involved edward of warwick in the plot this gave henry his opportunity warbeck was hanged at tyburn and poor warwick ended his long captivity at the block on tower hill so was played another act of tower tragedy sir william stanley concerned in the warbeck rising was also brought to the tower tried in the council chamber condemned and beheaded on tower hill on february sixteenth fourteen ninety five still the plottings against the unpopular henry went on and the headsman had ample work to do to tower hill came sir james tyrrell who had taken part in the murder of the princes and sir john wyndham both brought there for the aid they had given to the plottings of edmund de la pole earl of suffolk but now comes a break in the tales of bloodshed and the tower awoke once more to the sounds of feasting and rejoicing in celebration of the marriage of prince arthur and catherine of aragon in st paul's cathedral great tournaments and banquetings took place within the tower and in its immediate vicinity tower hill was gay with the coming and going of festive crowds the tower walls echoed what they seldom heard the sounds of piping and dancing records tell us too of elaborate pageants which strove to show the descent of the bridegroom from arthur of the round table this method of impressing the moving scenes of history on the spectator is not unknown to us in the present day hardly had five months passed away however when the prince who was but a lad of fifteen lay dead and his mother elizabeth of york who had given birth to a daughter in the tower in fifteen o three died nine days after prince arthur 
when six more years had passed the king whose reign had been so troubled was laid by the side of his wife in the glorious shrine in westminster abbey which bears his name henry the eighth was now on the throne at the age of eighteen and once again the tower looms largely in the view and approaches the height of its notoriety as state prison and antechamber to the place of death but as in former times the record is not one of unrelieved gloom the two sides of the picture are admirably exemplified at the beginning of henry's reign for shortly after he had imprisoned his father's extortioners empson and dudley and subsequently caused them to be beheaded on tower hill he made great show and ceremony during the court held at the tower before the first of his many weddings twenty-four knights of the bath were created and with all the ancient pomp and splendour for henry had a keen eye for the picturesque the usual procession from tower to westminster duly impressed by its glitter a populace ever ready to proclaim a coronation in the too human hope that the new will prove better than the old the young king appointed commissioners to make additions and improvements within the tower the roomy lieutenant's house was built and had access to the adjoining towers additional warders houses were erected and alterations were made within the bell and st thomas towers about this time the white tower received attention and from the state papers of the period we learn that it was embattled coped indented and crest with canned stone to the extent of five hundred feet it is almost as though henry were anxious that his royal prison should be prepared to receive the many new occupants of its rooms and dungeons that he was about to send there for no sooner were these renovations completed than the chronicle of bloodshed begins afresh the earl of suffolk already spoken of in connection with the plot in the preceding reign came to the axe in fifteen thirteen a few years passed and the tower was filled with men apprehended in city riots in an attempt to subdue which the tower guns were actually fired upon the city edward duke of buckingham at one time a favourite of henry's was traduced by wolsey who represented out of revenge that the duke laid some claim to the crown and he was beheaded on tower green on may seventeenth fifteen twenty one in brewer's introduction to the state papers of henry the eighth we read with reference to this trial and death of buckingham that the duke of norfolk not without tears delivered sentence thus you are to be led back to prison laid on a hurdle and so drawn to the place of execution you are there to be hanged cut down alive your members cut off and cast into the fire your bowels burnt before your eyes your head smitten off your body quartered and divided at the king's will buckingham heard this terrible form of punishment with calmness and said that so should traitors be spoken unto but that he was never one after the trial which had lasted nearly a week the duke was conveyed on the river from westminster to the temple steps and brought through east cheap to the tower buckingham's last words as he mounted the scaffold on the green were that he died a true man to the king whom through my own negligence and lack of grace i have offended in a few moments his head was off the block was covered with his blood and some good friars took up his body covered it with a cloak and carried it to the church of austin friars where it was buried with all solemnity so fell the once mighty buckingham and in his last moments and after his death he was not forgotten by poor religious men to whom in his lifetime he had been kind again the curtain falls on tragedy and rises on comedy twelve years later tower green was given over to revelry and laughter singing and mumming were revived under the walls of the white tower a writer of the time speaks of the marvellous cunning pageants and the fountains running with wine as henry brought hither his new queen anne boleyn for whom on her entry there was such a peal of guns as hath not been heard like a great while before once more also there was made procession in state but with scant applause of the people this time from tower hill to westminster soon the shadows return and the guns and music cease three short years pass and anne boleyn comes back to the tower in sadness and in silence 
on the spot where buckingham suffered her head on may nineteenth fifteen thirty six was severed from her body three days afterwards henry had married jane seymour during the short life of anne boleyn as queen bishop fisher and sir thomas more had come to the scaffold their imprisonment and death are dealt with in the next chapter the pilgrimage of grace a religious rising in the north mostly within the borders of yorkshire to protest against the spoliation of the monasteries and the threatened attack on the parish churches caused many a leader to be confined within the tower its dungeons were filled with prisoners the magnificent abbeys of rivaux fontans and Gervaux in the yorkshire dales were pulled down and to this day their noble ruins cry shame upon the despoilers to the tower came the abbots of Gervaux and fountains with the prior of bridlington and they were hanged eventually at tyburn tree other prisoners were lords hussey and darcy the first was beheaded in lincoln the other on tower hill with them were brought sir robert constable sir john and lady bulmer sir thomas percy sir francis biggled sir stephen hamilton robert ask william son of lord lumley and many a one of yorkshire birth whose names have not come down to us all were put to death without mercy in fifteen thirty seven end of chapter two part one